what we're going to leave here this morning is, if I do this well, you should be able to leave grounded with answers to these three questions. What is the test, the genetic test, impact across the triad of medicine, diagnostic, prognostic, therapeutic? What is that test yield? And what is that test problem? To set the stage, let's take care of a family together. And this is a family that I've had the honor of caring for. It's not their picture. I just lifted this from good housekeeping uh, because it was too tragic to use their own picture because the family started, story started in tragedy when Chase, the oldest child at age eight, died suddenly in Sunday school of all places. And here's the reason our medical examiner could give you and me the why. This is Chase's heart. So we know why Chase died, didn't we? What's her disease? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The family got an echo. And to a genetic cardiologist, do you know what uh, an echo is? It's a functional genomics assay. Because we're looking for phenotypic expressivity. And we're revealed by that echo was no doubt about it, autosomal dominant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Father, clear-cut non-obstructive HCM, never a symptom during his life, triple sport university level athlete. Baby brother at 18 months of age had an 18 millimeter wall thickness. The other two, age 10 and, and 9 or so, normal echoes. The baby brother at 18 months of age, mom rescues him at age two, toddling out of the bathtub with an external defibrillator shock, gets a defibrillator, and then from age two to age six, he has 12, 12 VF terminating ICD shocks. And then I meet him, and I tell the family, time to wave the white flag of surrender, let's move to transplant. That recommendation was too little too late, because two weeks after that first evaluation at Mayo Clinic, he died during episode number 13. So now the family has been cut in half, and they come to you and me with a fundamental question that only genetics can answer, and that is, how sure are you that our two living children whose echoes are normal don't have it? Not to say that we should change guidelines, not suggesting that at all, but to illustrate he is now 30, and guess how many ICD shocks he has had? Five. And with his first ICD shock for VF occurring while his echo was still normal. Now that's just not to shift the guidelines at all, but to illustrate the power of the genetic test. The only reason he's alive is the genetic test result that enabled us to have enlightenment as to who does and who does not have genetic vulnerability for the family's autosomal dominant disease. Really what a cardiologist should be familiar with is the two biggies. The one at 12 o'clock, MYBPC3 hokum, myosin binding protein C, and the one at one o'clock, MYH7 HCM beta myosin heavy chain. And why do you need to know those? Not just for what it told us about the rest of the family, who has it, who doesn't, but you need to know it for your patient. Why? Because your patient in front of you, where you're not wrestling with the diagnosis, it is different. Their story is different based upon, do they have a positive genetic test or a negative genetic test? How so? In every parameter we've looked at, those who are sarcomeric HCM, positive genetic test, HCM, it's a different disease. They present younger, they present thicker, there's more family history, of course, it's a genetic disease. And they were more apt to have a defibrillator as a surrogate of the assessed proarrhythmic potential. In addition, across time, compared to those with a negative genetic test, those with a positive genetic test progress towards end-stage disease. These are different diseases. They all get called HCM. The obstructives might meet the myectomy reduction, the septal my reduction therapist, but they're different diseases. And in fact, the positive genetic test was the strongest predictor of progression. The second question that you need to leave with an ant knowing the answer to, or how to find the answer is, what is that test yield? Meaning, in other words, you know your patient has said disease. What's the likelihood that the current generation genetic test will give me the answer? 
because we of all people should not be surprised if a test comes back negative. What? It's negative? You mean your, you, your three centimeter hypertroph doesn't have HCM? No, that's not what it means. So knowing the yield of the test can be helpful, like in the cardiomyopathy. Now if you order the HCM spell checker for the HCM on the left, it almost never comes back positive. If you order it for the HCM or on the right, it usually comes back positive. And in fact, that observation led to something that we called echo-guided genetic testing. The anatomy, the image, the echo guides your and my pre-genetic test anticipation as to whether we're dealing with sarcomeric driven HCM or not. And we brought that into clinical practice and the shape of the heart is still the strongest predictor of will my genetic test come back positive. And this is in a lot of HCM centers now. It's called the, the Mayo Clinic HCM Genotype Predictor Score. So based upon your patient in front of you, when your nurse, your PA, your fellow, whoever sets up for the patient and says, you're gonna see this patient diagnosed at this age, 23 versus 63, wall thickness, 25 versus 18, family history there, yes or no, and what's the shape of the heart, and what's the blood pressure? If you know those answers, now the range, the yield of the genetic test ranges from that. We need to move ourselves from literacy to fluency and understanding. We need to seek concordance between the genotype and the phenotype and embrace and respect the existence of genetic purgatory. You'll be a, you'll be a far better adjudicator of genetic test results. In other words, we need to be a wise user and an even wiser interpreter of genetic testing and the genetic test results.